after Billie Jean King gets in, Bobby Riggs is pulled in on a wagon with all these like 20 something hot twats in middle, you know, mini skirts and their nice. hair is huge. Hell he's yeah. he's wearing a shiny red jacket that says Sugar Daddy on the back. <laughs> Dude, and this this girls. rules. History I'd like to follow me down the rabbit hole. History Hello, and welcome to HILF, History I'd Like to Fuck with Don Brody. I'm Don Brody, and it's a joy podcasting here in the den. That's the Deluxe Edition Network. To hear other great podcasts in the den, follow the link in the show notes or go to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Today, I'm HILFing tennis with comedian Jeff Zenisek. Now, I don't play tennis, or watch tennis, really, but just like everything else, man, as I dug into the history of this game, I got a whole new appreciation for it. Like, no shit, I have tuned into matches long after the research for this episode was over. Have you seen the Serbian fella, Novak Djokovic? (laughs) Now, my guest, Jeff Zenisek, co-hosts his own comedy podcast, Two Woke Boys, which is ironic because on the day of this recording, he overslept and almost missed it. He's impossible to be mad at, though, and perhaps you'll agree, equally impossible not to like. Come along and hear the story of how the birth of tennis coincided with the death of a king, and about legendary rivalries between tennis greats fought hard in itty-bitty shorts. (laughs) Let's get started. You do look like your California mm-hmm. textbook yes. stoner buddy. Like, Hell what is yeah. it? What's the guy's name from Fast Times? Sp- uh, Spicoli. Spicoli. Yeah. You look definitely Spicoli hanging mm-hmm. dude. Yeah. Is that true to your personality? Uh, I don't think so. I hate surfing. Okay. I, I don't like the beach. Um, I'm not. Are you a stoner? No, not really. Hmm. Yeah. My, my joke is that if I smoked i'd be dumber than i already am which is bad (laughs) so like you know people are like oh it just makes you dumb like oh well i'm already there so it would just kill me if i did it (laughs) but and you don't but you do sleep in you sleep in and i do smoke also so you know just it's it's not like my identity i'm not like 420 bro like i'm not that guy it's just actually so natural to you this you don't make a big deal out of it i didn't start till way late also yeah. when how old were you when you started uh like 32 yeah so you yeah. really did take your time but yeah. you always sounded and kind of looked like this you were finally yes. like i may as well lean into it yeah like it would annoy people when yeah. i didn't you yeah. know yeah. like the first time i went to the weed store i was like hey i don't know anything about weed they were like Pfft. yeah <laughs> they're like good one bro <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> And I'm like, uh, seriously, I don't know anything. I'm like, I'm aware I look like this. Yeah. And then they're Please like, help me. Yeah. So. I wonder if it's the same thing for like really buttoned up smart looking people. You know, like real oh, poindexters yeah. are like, well, like you probably can do my taxes. stoner idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they're just like, hey, He looks man. like a CPA. <laughs> he shows up to H&R Block yeah. and they're like, oh, here's your desk, sir. Like, no, I need help with my taxes. Please believe me. Yeah. That is better to be that guy, though. You know what I mean? Sure. Like that, like you want to look like a Clark Kent, you know? Sure. Like you don't want to look like the Joker, like normally. I don't know. It depends on whether you like to have your expectations raised they're, or lowered. Because They're of, pretty low. Because you're a drug test. You got to know that the technician that takes your urine sample sure. is like, son of a bitch. Yeah. They're Nothing. like, they, they have a pool. Like who, how high <laughs> is it going to be? That's right. That's what, right. Yeah. How bad is he going to fail it? Yeah. Yeah. See, and I, on the other hand, I'm cruising in with my Bob and my minivan mm-hmm. with the car seat in the back, just smoking joints everywhere yeah. <laughs> I go in this city. <laughs> See, that's good, though. Yeah. But yeah. like you probably. And people like, wrote, like the cop pulls me over and is like, madam, there must have been someone smoking weed yeah, in this someone van. Someone broke into your car and smoked weed like, and put yeah. a joint in your hand Babe. while we're talking. Yeah, his name is Jeff Senesek, <laughs> and he lives in Toluca Lake. <laughs> He's probably asleep right now. <laughs> Let me introduce your your uh credits now because you okay. people now can visualize who you are they <laughs> they know <laughs> generally what you're up to i first met jeff in the comedy clubs 
I'm usually an MC. That is often my role. And so, uh, and I'm, and I think I may be tooting my own horn here. I kind of impressed you because I pronounced Zenisek like boom. You nailed it. Yes. Polish, right? It's a uh, Czech. Okay. So yeah. neighbors, they're, yeah, yeah. they're, they're holding right hands. There. They're, yeah. they're holding hands over there. Mm -hmm. Um, and you perform all over LA, mm -hmm. um, comedy and magic club mm -hmm. regular. And you've also performed overseas yeah. for our troops, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and Germany. What was that like? Uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah. I got to entertain the troops, uh, with three other comics. There were, um, two from New York, one from Chicago, and I was the only one from LA. Cool. And, uh, it was amazing. We did like, I don't know, like 15 shows in like 20 days. Did they try to shave you? Did they ever try to get you in the barber no. chair and give you the high and tight? No, they did not. So <laughs> thank God for that. Thank but, goodness. But yeah, um, it, was, it was awesome. Like we went everywhere. And it was like, you know, we had like a tour manager. So like all we had to do was like, you know, they'd be like be in the lobby at 6 a.m. and we're going to the next thing. So and then it's they'd like, wait we, for you until they'd wait for me. I'd roll in at 11 45. <laughs> Not the military yeah. girl. They get you up. No, they, yeah, they did. So, and I was very like, you know, I know I look like this. Don't be that guy. Don't be the, you know, like yeah. with the other three dudes there, I didn't want to be the shithead that was like ruining everything. Yeah. Cause I was also the only guy representing Los Angeles. Right. Sure. I'm representing Los Angeles. I look very Los like Angeles. You represent Los Angeles. So yes. like, you know, two New York guys, they're like, Oh, we got to go like speed. And I'm like, Oh, what? <laughs> I, I didn't want to be that guy. So I was like, Oh, you guys are waking up at six. I'm waking up at five forty. You Good know, for you. so yeah, yeah it was super cool. I loved it. And then this is all very topical because you're also a TikTok guy. Mm -hmm. You have several posts, mm -hmm. over fifteen million views. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. That's the that's the ghost everybody's chasing around here, right? Is mm -hmm. the follow are you following what's going on right now With about the TikTok? They want to ban TikTok. They want to take it down. They ban it. Yeah, it's weird. How would that affect you if TikTok just suddenly disappeared? Uh, it would suck. Uh, I mean, I did get banned on there several times. So like, you did. Yeah. Why? So, uh, well, you know, my posts, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, like it's, it's hard to say. Cause it's like my posts were like, uh, when I started my podcast, they're like satirical. Yeah. So like, some people don't get satire. Yeah. So they think it's like real or whatever. Yeah. And I should tell folks who don't know, Two Woke Boys, it's hilarious. It's mm -hmm. a series of videos and a podcast. Mm -hmm. And what's your co-host's name? Uh, Malcolm Kellner. Malcolm Kellner mm -hmm. and Jeff Zanisak. Basically, the, the perspective is that they are, as two white cis guys, mm -hmm. the voice for women and people of color. That's and they right. just lean <laughs> yeah. way into, we're the wokest of woke. Yeah. And but it's, of it's, course, you're welcome for all of the perspectives. And of course, yeah. they're constantly mansplaining and we're, making yeah, horrible, we're wrong and, horrible Yeah, takes. we're constantly wrong. We're always like mansplaining everything. Like you know, we have no ability to see outside of our own yeah. faults. And I think it's great. I like it because it like great satire does. Mm -hmm. It is more of a nuclear bomb than a spear in the sense yeah. that it's sort of everyone <laughs> in the radius gets a piece of this, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you are simultaneously, it seems to me, lampooning mm -hmm. the excessively sensitive and woke and yeah. like using the new keywords to demonstrate outwardly how well they understand everything in the world and how sympathetic they are to everything and that's you're lampooning that but you also manage to lampoon sexist racist pigs yeah. at, the, at yeah. the same time so i don't know i think it's fucking great thank you yeah yeah we try to do all that stuff but on tiktok some people thought it was crazy so you know and honestly like everything i've ever posted the the whole point was like I hope people think this is funny. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. that was my, I want to spread joy to everyone. That was like my goal. And then just seeing it like, this guy sucks. What a jerk. You know, what yeah. a piece of shit. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. All right. And then also getting banned is crazy because it's like, I get my post like removed for like harassment and bullying. Like my post, yeah. which if you would break it down in the most, simple like concise form it would be i guess hey feminism can be a little silly sometimes <laughs> right that's like right. the the post and then posts my post gets removed and then there's like 
a million posts that are like Jeff Zinisek is a douchebag <laughs> who should kill himself, and those right. are on there. Sure, those are still there. Sure, that's not which problematic. Is crazy, that, yeah. So, how do you get back from a ban? Do you have to like prove I'm really not a piece of? I mean, that seems like it was crazy because like there was like it, it wasn't like things got taken down. There were two posts that were removed. Um, <clears throat> one of them was uh, actually yeah. Two were actually removed, but there were like three or four that were like in question. But it was really just like groups of people that are like, let's flag his content. Right. So like, you know, and that's the thing. It's like, there's no people that work there. Like I've never talked to a person. Right. You know, so like. The algorithm is taking people's cues. Yeah. yeah. You're just talking to like a fake whatever, you know, like those, you know, those like support calls where they're like. Hi, I'm a, a robot I'm here person. To assist you. Sure. Yeah, I'm a robot and you are bad. <laughs> yeah. You know, so and you're yeah. like, oh, yeah, what's a stoplight? Find yeah. all the stoplights. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm so delighted that you have come here and, and joined me eventually. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> At my table, this is awesome. And as you know, I am a bona fide historian, right? I love got it. a degree, I study the stuff, I've worked for institutions all over the place, and I love doing deep dives into literally any fucking thing that my guest finds interesting from history. And I reached out to you to be on the show and you assigned me tennis. Mm -hmm. I uh, was thrilled because I love going in raw. I love a virgin and I don't, I don't know about tennis. It's not my world, but can you tell me before we start the hill thing of this stuff, what it is about tennis that made you assign the subject? Well, uh, before I was doing comedy, I was trying to play professional tennis. Um, I played semi-professional tennis. Um, I won a national title uh, at the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Um, and let's see, I was ranked in the top three in the state of Florida in men's open, and I was ranked like 115 in the country Fucking at one point. A. So, yeah. I had no idea. An onion. You're an onion, Jeff Zenith. That's right. So, when was the last time you played a professional, yeah, competitive well, tennis, if not professional competitive uh, tennis? Okay. Like, the last time I tried a professional event was probably 2013 or 14, maybe. Okay. Maybe 15. All right. I, so- I did have a, a, so I had two wrist surgeries when it was like 2011 or 12. And uh, that set me out for like a long time, like maybe like two years. And then sure. I tried to come back. And then, uh, you know, I was having more like body pain and like recovering was tough. And, you know, I was getting older as a player and I was like, okay, like if I do make it per se, what my story in tennis would be like, a, you know, a magical like third round exit at like a major. Yeah. Which like, who which is great. Get, well, Sure. But who gives a shit? But then, you what? Know? yeah, it's like, are you getting endorsements? Are you going to no, continue a life? Yeah, of tennis I want to. I want to be right. great, and like that would just be like a guy that like you know, famous player beat the shit out of you know. Yeah. And everybody would be like, who's that? That dork, you yeah. know. So, do you ever still play? Do you? Yeah, like, yeah. I love playing. I I play you know as much as I can. Do you hustle at the park? Like oh, stroll dude. up like surfer guy? Like oh, is oh, this a tennis racket, no, bro? That's yeah, not really that fun. No, you'll play. <laughs> Like there, there, there there is like a level of dudes that, that kind of do that. But like, I'm definitely like past that level or whatever. But, um, they're like, once you get past a certain level, like anyone good is like making appointments to play with like the other good guy that is like pretty nice at tennis. So, um, yeah, it's very like. It's a very buttoned up sport. We make appointments. We show up on time. Yeah. Fifteen hundred. So you know, tennis is very stuffy and uptight, and they try to make it like fun, Mm -hmm. which is always like horrible. (laughs) I like it's a different sport. Like embrace that it's like, hey, points are about to play. Shut the fuck up. Like that's cool. That's a cool thing about tennis. That like, you know, but people come into tennis and they're like, why isn't there like like a guy? Why is like? Why don't people like paint their chest with letters and, you know, throw a beach ball in the crowd? It's like you're like even golf loosened up a little bit. Come on, tennis. They're like, nah, we ain't gonna do that. There's one. There's there's usually like a guy at the courts that are like that, like at a pro tournament, and that guy rules. You need that guy there. That guy's awesome. He's holding up the flag for his country. 
screaming and Great. like whatever language it is. Uh-huh. He cares so much about this guy you've never heard of. That's awesome. Yeah. You need that. And he's way up in the stands. Mm. Like, he's never good seats. No. They would right. not let that would, guy No, he's set. sent somewhere. Yeah. yeah. They're like, sit as far away as possible. So this can be your new role in tennis, is to be the occasional needed hype guy. Yeah. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for someone else. Yeah, there. <laughs> we need those guys there. I'm but, glad. Yeah. I'm glad. Well, I think I could be, especially after doing this research, I think I could nominate myself to be... A that tennis, enth- uh, enthusiastic, especially yeah. if it's like, we just need you to sit alone and be too enthusiastic about something that other people find boring. And I'm like, please, yeah. this is what I've been born to do. <laughs> what I'm going to tell you about now is the sources of my research, where I went to learn all the stuff I learned about the history of tennis. Um, I did. There were some very good documentaries. Okay. I talked about the origin and the major players and some of the biggest changes in, through tennis history, which was great. I watched this adorable young man from South Korea explain in detail the scoring system okay. because I didn't get it. It was <laughs> yeah. very weird. No one, I didn't, no one gets it. It's insane. Totally it insane. It takes months to explain to people. Honestly, my head hurt, and I'm sitting yeah. crisscross applesauce in front of YouTube just like... Okay, then, like, it seems so simple. You just hit this ball, but boy, howdy, how no. those points work is they're not even, they don't even call them numbers. Very yeah. exciting. They also changed, they've been changing scoring for years, too. Like, there's different ways to keep score, and there's different um, ways that scoring stuff yeah. in. And part of the reason happening. why it's so difficult is because you'll be reading what should be a really straightforward, mm-hmm. like, four points. You need four points to win, but two points more than your opponent, and usually. Mm. And then, and then well, there'll, that's a there'll game. be a usually, exactly. That and is then a game, sets, which is played in a set, which is, which then is played in a match. match. It's, yeah. ex- it's very exciting. It's mm-hmm. like when you take the little uh, eggs open and there's another little lady egg inside. It's thr- It's a very thrilling. Russian doll situation. <laughs> and then they added <laughs> yes. the tie breaks, you know. Totally. That so. was also, that, I thought that was really cool, though, because anything, yeah. because tennis is the way tennis is, anytime there is a change, it's huge because yeah. it, everyone had to agree on it. It was cool. Yeah. Um, I watched, Jeff, mm-hmm. the entirety of the recorded live television broadcast of the 1973 Battle of the Sexes between okay. Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King. Nice. It was a thrill. It was okay. a thrill. That that had my toes all curled up. I was I kind of don't it. know much about it. So Brilliant. I yeah, I'm kind of interested in that. Brilliant. You know. Um, and then I listened to this very cool history podcast um, about specific players. And, and in particular, I fell for this guy named Bjorn Borg. Oh, yeah. I, I cannot imagine you've lived in the world of tennis and people he have ruled, not yeah. told you and told you how Crazy much you look story. like him too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because yeah. it's kind of un, uncanny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that those are my sources. My plan is we're going to talk about the origin of tennis, where it came from, where this bullshit slash beautiful scoring system came from, why it's called the stuff it's called, the first people to play, all that kind of stuff. Uh Then um, I'm going to jump into what I'm calling my TILFs, tennis I'd like to fuck, the individuals and matches and stories from tennis that are the most orgasmic. I love that. (laughs) Uh, I love that. From beginning to end. So uh, are you ready to fuck? Dude, I'm so excited. The beginning of tennis, 1300 France. There were other games that Mm -hmm. looked the same, right? And tennis is really um, like a Frankenstein's monster, like little pieces of games that came around and eventually it all coalesced around this game we call tennis. And then once it sort of coalesced around the game we call tennis, it changed very little from that point. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was King Louis X who was just a fucking fan of this game, Jouet de Palme, that you smack this ball with your hand back and forth over a net. He liked it so much, he built an indoor court in his palace. Mm -hmm. And just the kings and queens of Europe, they fuck each other, they trade their kids, they they want what everyone else has. So pretty quickly, the other crowned heads of Europe are like, yeah, I want one of these courts in my palace. So there becomes... How big was the court, court. you know? Comparable to the court that we have now, but the walls were the uh, outside. So instead of like drawing lines. So if you lines, hit the wall, it's out. Yes. Okay. Although not always. See, that's the thing. The rules yeah. were really varied. It was yeah. sort of like the, the it's common like beer pong, thing. You got house rules. You couldn't be more. <laughs> you couldn't be more accurate. Or you hit the wall. Oh well, oh, yeah. at my yeah. palace, it's cool to hit the wall. Yeah, in Colorado, yeah. what we do is you Elbows, put, bro. Elbow, you only yeah. do use your toes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's exactly what's going on. And some people are calling the game 
tene, which is a French word for basically get it, catch this, receive it. It's like tene, get that. Yeah. So they call it tene, they call it jus de palm, they call it court tennis, royal tennis, lawn. They, mm. They're naming it all of these things, and there are variations here or there, but this yeah. court is give or take a big open space in your house with a net in the middle. People mm -hmm. stand on either side. They're trying to get, you know, that's the thrust of it. I, now, we would not... Sorry, go ahead. I did say, I was going to say, um, when I went to the International Tennis Hall of Fame in uh, Rhode Island, that's where yes. that is for the United States. Yes. It's like super historic. There's a big tennis museum there. They do have a, uh, t a court tennis, tennis court, which yeah. is like this huge indoor thing and it's ridiculous, like, you know, but people still play it and all of them are like 85 years old. For, and they were young, yeah. right? Probably the youngest. Yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. Group, well, right? yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it was crazy too, because when I was up there playing the, the tennis tournament there, they, I went out for drinks once and one of those court tennis dorks came with us. Oh. And this guy oh, was no. ridiculous, dude. <laughs> he was like, so like, oh, I'm like one of the top players in the world at court tennis and like you're the, the only you're yeah. like there's five guys that yeah. play it like you're just one of the five guys yeah you, it's know? Like, you know we use wooden rackets with <laughs> bull guts it's like dude i will Shut smoke up. you at this <laughs> like if i start playing that yeah. i will immediately become number one in the world oh my god i want to see that match yeah. right now it was ridiculous ridiculous so. well here's what the crazy part though is that we would not know mm -hmm. that that king louis the fucking 10th liked this game i mean we might know that the annals of history might reveal that their crowns heads of Europe have these courts in their house and they all like to play. <clears throat> yeah. But why we have this like, know that the origin of tennis is right around Louis X is because one day he was playing a particularly vigorous game of tennis. Afterwards, he goes and chugs a quantity of chilled wine, as okay. you do, and he fucking dropped dead. Wow. Immediately. Holy shit. And he's got... A wife in jail for adultery. He's got a pregnant wife with the heir in her bot. I mean, crazy. So the historical record was like, all of a sudden, this major event in Middle Ages European history is tied to tennis. Wow. Because of fucking that guy was he Was he poisoned? Thank you. That's what a lot of people said. They were yeah. like, boy, how? I mean, a lot of people wanted him dead. How, it would have benefited a lot of people. How fat was this guy, though? He wasn't that fat because he had a good tennis regimen. You know, okay. he stayed fit. But sure, he still but, did guzzling. But you're also wine. drinking wine on the changeovers. As thin, as, as, as healthy as any French yeah. <laughs> king can be in the Middle <laughs> yeah. Ages. But no, a lot of people were like, oh, he was <clears> utter, <throat> totally poisoned. I mean, nobody seemed to blame tennis, which is the good news. But yeah. nonetheless... When we look to the origin of tennis, the first references of tennis, you're like Louis X because yeah. he literally loved it, built courts everywhere, and died immediately after he played a game. So wow. there you go. They're going to be together. And then the game, to your point, it was like <laughs> our rules, our court, our uh -huh. palace, balls, different sizes, how long you play, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. In was the, the seven, ball originally like felt and all that stuff? It was filled with feathers. It was okay. it was really light, but it didn't go very far. Yeah, and it was um, played it in was, on grass, right? It was outdoor court. It was played on grass, mm -hmm. and it, or they did clay right away, like depending on what they had. Um, but the 1700s is when they get the racket. So they're still slapping this thing with their hands. <laughs> wow! Until the 1700s, they get a racket. Yes. Then 1830, we get the lawnmower. Okay. Bing. <laughs> and the wow. lawnmower, as an invention, tra uh, transformed most of our sports from tennis to soccer to football, um, baseball, the way that we could now use these wide open spaces. How were people cutting lawns before the lawnmower? Like scissors and shit? I think they do like a scythe. So the Grim Reaper is just <clears throat> hacking it. at your yard. I, I would think so. That would be one way. Oh. Or what they do is flatten it. Uh -huh. Try to like get, you know, something that they would lay out in the, but then you're still tripping on it or you dig it up and they, you put down dirt. They take a guillotine sideways and just like, you know, the yeah. French are very, uh, <laughs> yeah. they, they can use a guillotine for more things than yeah. you think. Um, so in the world of times, we got the game, we got the net, we know how to slap them back and forth. We got a racket. We've mm -hmm. got lawnmowers. Next important element to create tennis is some idle rich guys. Okay. Okay. Check. We've got Harry, Jem, and Augurio Pereira. They live in Birmingham, England. They got a big grassy yard that's nice and flat. They got time on their hands. And they know about this game, tennis, court tennis, whatever people are calling it, lawn tennis. And they fucking love it. And they mm -hmm. play it at their house. They set up a net. The people who come to their house parties they have a great time. They get some doctors. And they set up 
a tennis club, your first tennis club in like the 1870s. And these, you know, people are having a good time. Yeah. One of these guys who's come to this like rock and tennis party and had a blast is named Walter Winfield. And he writes a letter to these two guys in 1873. And he's like, you know that game we had so much fun playing at your house? Well, I was thinking about it a lot. Mm. And I have come up with a new game and it's called <laughs> Schwer Sticky. Schwer well, These guys got to get some marketing I going. I know. Dude. It's a Greek word that basically means hit the ball with the stick. Okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but Schwer Sticky is kind of fun to say. And people start calling it sticky right yeah. dude patents the game okay. and he's an entrepreneur so he starts putting together these kits where he's got your net yeah. your poles your rackets your ball all of these guys that do the the like invention of stuff they're all like sham wow guys absolutely so like think of that energy for of a sure. guy like in 1873 just always. Yeah. always yeah and it's forever and that's exactly right and so he's getting it and he sends out jeff thousands of these sphere stickies mm -hmm. and people fucking love it and they are stoked and they're playing and the most important thing that he puts in your sphere sticky yeah. package is the rules okay and right now the people who currently run all of the official tennis organizations all over the world all agree that the rules of tennis as they exist are because of this guy walter winfield we cut the name wow. as much fun as sticky is to say where's the rules walter that winfield from he was from england okay and he's sending these things all over, though, thousands of these things all over the world, and people are loving it. Mm -hmm. One of the gals who gets her hands on one of these sticky sets is Mary Ewing Outerbride, who gets hers in Bermuda and brings it back to uh, the place you mentioned, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And she comes back, and she's like, you guys are never going to believe how much fun this sticky game is. And they set up a court, and they get the lawn mowed, and people are like, yeah, 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 it's kind of like tennis, and I play it. And they come in droves to play, and this is how it gets set in the United States. Yeah. But the same thing happens in the United States that happened in Europe, which is like, there's just enough variation, though. Mm -hmm. And literally, the balls in Boston are just bigger than the balls in New York. <laughs> Among yeah. other things, they have to like come together to figure out <laughs> what are the rules so we can play each other and figure out who's the best, right? Yeah. So in 1881... They set up the United States Tennis Association. They standardize things. Then they get in league with the same sort of international now tennis association so that we can play internationally. Mm -hmm. And everyone's going to uh, agree on how this thing works. By the time we get to 1924, mm -hmm. we've got the rules. We've got the courts. We've got the rackets. We've got the guidelines. And we can start competing with each other with the same basic understanding. Mm -hmm. And that was 100 years ago. Wow. And with the exception of a few scoring things and introducing the tiebreaker, mm -hmm. the rules of that tennis didn't have not changed. The, the tiebreaker didn't even happen until like the 1970s too, right? Yeah. yeah. And it was because these fucking games could go, they on, go on for on days. Forever. Which is a cool thing about tennis, okay? This yeah. is like an awesome thing about tennis. And um, I don't know if you know, but... They, there's been a lot of scoring stuff happen in the last uh, 10 years because of a match that happened not that long ago mm. at Wimbledon between uh, uh, Nicholas Mahout and John Isner. I have that down. Okay. It went 11 hours and five minutes, but it took three days. Like mm -hmm. they, they had three a, full days. Three full so, days. And this was at Wimbledon. Okay. Yeah. They play. The, since it's on grass, this is the original surface that tennis is played on. So they don't play early in the morning because of the dew on the grass. So it has to oh, be like the that sun was has why. to. I was wondering why. Yeah. So they play natural sunlight. And then also if it gets too dark, the grass starts to get dew on it. And the, the ball gets heavy as shit because it's like picking whatever up off the ground. Like the it's I, I played Amazing. my my one title is on on grass. So. Nice. My, I have titles, but my national title, the nice. important one, is on grass. And uh, do you remember who won that match? Uh, yes, it was uh, John Isner, mm -hmm. and that's the American. It was American versus a yeah. French guy. I, dude, I remember watching that match over the course of those three days. Really? Because yeah, I remember watching the first like the first day. I was watching it, watching Wimbledon. I was like, oh, this is cool. Went to the gym. Come back. They're still playing. I'm like, are you shitting me? This is crazy. Oh, my God. Then I kind of like turned off, go about my life or whatever. Then, you know, two days later, people were like, you watching the Isner match? And I'm like, that was... I'm sorry. Was on repeat? Like two, yeah. That's what I thought. I was like, on repeat. That was like two days ago, right? And they're like, it's still happening. Oh I'm God. like, what? 
Yeah. They literally, like, it's crazy. And you can't, and you can imagine, in addition to losing fans, because people yeah. are already like, why the fuck would I invest in this game when I can't even watch it end and I don't know how long it's going to go on. And live fans, of course, are the realities of modern sports and where they get all their money, which is uh-huh. TV. You, How can you schedule yeah. but television that's, programming and advertising? And But that's awesome about tennis. It's that's also totally coolest, awesome. Yeah. That's the coolest thing about tennis was that it could go on like that. Like you have to win by two games. You have to win by a break of serve, uh-huh. right? Yeah. But then it doesn't help that during the course of the game, you're hearing 15, 30, 40... Yeah. Love and and it's hard. Yeah, yeah. It's so confusing. Yeah. The origin of this is that the original tennis games were played. Uh, the scoring and the time both happened on the face of a clock, a sixty-minute uh, clock. So the top of the clock was weird. zero. Fifteen would be so the first used, like, point. So they used like an analog clock to keep score. Exactly, and it would be like who had the point at the fifteen minutes. D- they didn't after have the like an abacus or anything no, around. No, and here's what's so dumb: every time you think you get an explanation for this shit, you're like, "But that doesn't make any sense." Because you're mm-hmm. like, "Okay, so it's fifteen thirty forty five. So why is it forty? Yeah. And the, every source I found is like, "Yeah, because forty five was just harder to say, so they just said forty. I was like, "But all this shit is harder <laughs> to say, so why didn't they get rid why, of all of it? Why not one, two, three, four? <laughs> exactly. So it's fifteen is one point. 30 uh-huh. is two points. 40 is three points. Love is zero. Uh-huh. And where that comes from is because the zero at the top of the clock where you'd start yeah. is shaped like an egg. Okay. And in French, the word for egg is luf. Oh, uh, okay. So we went love. Okay. All but of it. But then also if you get to 40 a piece, that's deuce. That's deuce. Exactly. Uh-huh. Because now you're tied at three, mm-hmm. which I think the theory is because you have to win by two. It's mm-hmm. just very, the point yeah. is the shorts are short. And if that's all you can focus on, yeah. <laughs> let someone else tell you yeah. when they're about to go. So I actually have a couple of pop quiz questions for you. And I'm really glad I did this because you clearly know your tennis shit, Jeff. You're okay. for real. All right. Thank you. So we talked about very weird, like when you get two, if, if it's, if, it's 40 each. You call that deuce. Mm-hmm. What is, in scoring of tennis, a jam, donut, or a love set? A love set is mm-hmm. where no, the other guy doesn't score a point, right? That's right. The loser okay. of the set has won zero points. We, we would call that a golden set. I don't know if that ah. was called on there. But yeah, golden set is if the other player does not score a point ah. during that because set. Because it's golden for you. Yeah. <laughs> Now, love, love okay, let me baby. quiz you. Oh, Do you shit. know what a bagel is? No. If you bagel somebody? Let me let me see if I can guess. If you bagel somebody, mm-hmm. it means that you smeared them on the court. Kind of, but oh. they did not score a game. Zero. Bagel. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. So they well, scored no games. They may have scored points. but See, not. and this is, this is critical for those of you who don't know tennis. So you can play a game. Mm-hmm. Then there are a certain number of games in a set, mm-hmm. and you have to win a certain number of sets to win the match. Mm-hmm. All of this to say, you could play upwards of 30 games mm-hmm. with an opponent before it is determined who won the match. And simply winning the most number of games is not necessarily the deal because you have to win them by a certain number of points you, to yeah. get. And the you set. can also win a match and score less points than your opponent which is a cool thing about tennis. It, it, I love that stuff and, about tennis. And this is the other thing that's really awesome about tennis. This is my favorite thing about tennis with the scoring yeah. is that at no point until the match is over, is it actually over? You can be down a match point and three hours later, come back and win the match. You are not out of time. It's You are thrilling. never out of time. Here's a pop quiz for you. The Grand Slam tournament is considered the most prestigious tennis events Mm -hmm. in the world. There are four Mm -hmm. of them. Please name them an extra credit if you name them in the order that they happen throughout the year. Uh, The first Grand Slam is the Australian Open. Correct. And that is in Australia, Melbourne. (laughs) Yes. Uh, The second Grand Slam is the French Open, Mm -hmm. which is in France. Correct. Uh, Then the uh, third Grand Slam is Wimbledon. Yes. Uh, then the fourth Grand Slam is the U.S. Open. Amazing. A plus. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, and the money's huge. If you win in the singles, the Australian Open, 
Top amount is give or take $75 million. If you win the French Open. I don't believe that's if you win the whole thing. I believe that's the purse for the whole tournament. Purse for the whole. Oh, divided up among mm -hmm. the deal. That's yeah, good yeah. to know. Uh, $42 million at the French Open. $40 million at Wimbledon. And $57 million yeah. in the U.S. Open. So the, you, you're yeah. going to do good yeah. if you do. And plus the endorsements, all that. So this part is called Slam Happy. Depending on what Grand Slam championships, these Opens, you win, you have these various titles. Okay. okay. So what is a Grand Slam? Uh, it's one of the majors, right? Winning all four. Yeah. Oh, they say oh, if, you, okay. yeah, if yeah, you yeah. get the Grand Slam, you've won... All four majors. All yes. four. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A Grand Slam standalone means you won them all the same year. Yeah. Um, Don and Budge did it first in 1938. Who was the last person to do that? Um, that is a great question. Um, I think it might be Serena. Okay. But I, I don't know if Serena <clears throat> ever won all four in a year. I'm she not did, sure. She is a career. She's a career grand slam. And she slam, has, but and that's yes. funny. There's another one. The career golden slam, which oh, okay. is you won. Where you won, win the, uh, the gold medal at the, also. So you won yeah. all four majors and you get a gold medal. And the only tennis player who has a standalone golden grand slam, that means in one calendar year, uh -huh. they won all four majors and a gold medal in the Olympics. Um, and that's Steffi Graf, uh, who did yeah. it in 1988. And she's married to Andre <clears throat> Agassi and is one of the best. I believe she might be the greatest female player of all time. That's what a lot yeah. of my stuff is telling she me. She was <clears throat> incredible. Now, there is an interesting story with her. There was a player that came around that was giving her trouble, uh, Monica Seles. She had two hands on both sides and was like just ferocious. Like yeah. super try hard, runs around, doesn't give up, you know, relentless. You know? Crazy. She was like starting to give Steffi trouble a and then at one of the grand slams i forget which one a fan came from the audience and stabbed <gasps> yeah and stabbed monica sellis oh and my the, god yeah. they yeah. had their tanya harding tennis uh -huh. why doesn't why didn't the world and this know was, uh, it was where'd she know, get stabbed uh i think in the shoulder Fuck. or something like that yeah yeah so and she was never the same since oh my god and that was uh the room you know the rumors that was a big steffi fan that stabbed her <gasps> Is that true? Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Way to go. Uh huh. See, it you said like, you said people don't like tennis. Some yeah, people fucking she, love. Yeah. Tennis. She didn't like. I don't think Steffi was like involved or anything. No. I think it was just a psycho fan or whatever. But uh, it did like ruin that girl's legacy. That's horrible. Know? And there and I have not seen so, any yeah. kind of like they do not really separate the spectators yeah. from the players well, much still at all. You remember like in the eighties, like there'd be like the the kissing bandit and like these people would like <laughs> yeah. run on the field and they'd like a streaker guy and be like woo. Yeah, go. Yeah. That moment changed how like fan on field sp shit has like been sure. dealt with since. Yeah, you see those folks, especially like in the NFL, mm -hmm. and you can see the joy in the eyes of the yeah. person that gets to just <laughs> yeah. take their yeah. spleen. Yeah. This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's Deluxe Edition Network. Com. Hey, this is Ron. Do you like movies? Hey, this is Ragnar. Y'all like alcohol? Hey guys, this is Stu. Do you like punishments? Hey everybody, I'm Chase. You guys, do you guys <laughs> like alcohol poisoning? And this is Lenny from Barrel Age Flicks. Sobriety is so overrated. Welcome to Season 3, 2023. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. See you there. Hey, before we grasp our rackets and get back in the court with Jeff, did you catch me on Jim Jeffrey's podcast? I don't know about that. It came out last month, March 2023, and it was a blast. I fuck Frankenstein with him, and he makes me laugh so hard I snort. <laughs> now, if you're wondering how something so cool could have happened and you didn't know about it, well, guess what? You would have known about it if you... Follow me, follow me, follow me, follow Well, we are back. We have um, used the restroom, mm -hmm. smoked some dope, scratched yogurt, all of the critical things. I would imagine this we is exactly what you do 
during the break from every professional tennis yes. <laughs> yes. tennis match, some variety of this. Mm-hmm. Um, this second half is where I get into some of my favorite stories. The first couple stories I'm going to tell you are about phenomenal rivalries. Love this. Great, yeah, great matches yeah. between really uh, colorful characters. And the very first one is from 1973. <clears throat> it is the Battle of the Sexes between Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King. And when mm. I mentioned this at the very beginning, you said, yeah, you know about it because it's mm. sort of a legendary match. Yeah. But you don't really know a lot about like... Yeah, I didn't like study it. I'm not like a whiz on the topic or anything <laughs> like that. So, yeah. Well, it's cool and it has all of my very favorite Hilfie stuff because it's this cool standalone story mm. of a 55-year-old retired tennis pro, Bobby mm. Riggs, who looks... Like 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 Austin Powers. He makes Austin Powers look like James Bond. Yeah. Like he has a very his a mouthful of teeth, <laughs> kind of a yeah. toady little head and body. And he's fifty five. I did see some pictures of him when he was a pro, and he was slightly cuter. But like yeah. this confidence comes from somewhere where we're not entirely yeah. clear. Yeah. Self proclaimed male chauvinist pig. Yeah. Says I. He's like an Andrew Tate of the time. Exactly yeah, right. Yeah. And he was very like, no, let me be clear. The female <laughs> species is inferior to the male species in every way. Yeah. And in addition to that, they're not as good at tennis. But, but we, let me back say. Back then, weren't people just saying that anyway? That's couldn't, you couldn't so be like, more right. And, yeah. But also, but people have been saying that, of course, for centuries. What yeah. was unique about 1973 uh-huh. was not that there was a male chauvinist pig suggesting that men are just definitively better than women at everything from the bottom up. Yeah. But. That people were saying, no, come on. That's what was new in 73. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason I love this story so much is because it is so 1973. <laughs> yeah. And it's also got this like ne- like wonderful story in the middle. And it really defines a lot of like what tennis was going through. So you can tell the story of American history, tennis history, gender uh-huh. history within yeah. this like one little encounter, right? <laughs> There had already been within the world of tennis, as there is now in most professional sports, the incredible disparity between men and women's pay. Mm. But specifically, there was this guy named Jack Kramer, who Mm. was also a former tennis pro, who was buddies with Bobby Riggs, who is now at this point in the 70s a promoter. And he also produces these big high ticket exhibition matches between people. He had, he and Bobby Riggs had got done one in like Madison square garden and he was doing good things to get people kind of stoked about tennis and to make tennis kind of sexy. But even his tournaments, the top prize for the number one dude in that tournament would be $12,000. And the top prize for the number one woman in that tournament would be like $1,100. And the women were like, why is our prize money so much less? We're playing the same game. We're traveling the same distance. We are competing in the same clubs. And he would say, because you're women and you play less and you're worth less. And there's no reason why you should make as much as a man. Quit crying. So there was no like gentle coded language. And so the women were like, fuck you, Jack Kramer. So there's a line. Okay, uh-huh. so Bobby Riggs, who who I, who also was a tennis pro in the '40s, is retired at 55 and a degenerate gambler. He was making his money largely by gambling and betting on himself and betting yeah. against himself. Yeah, yeah, this was not out of league. Yeah, um, for him. Yeah. He had started by saying, I'm going to prove that women are less than men. Even me, out of shape, 55, I can Mm. beat any woman, including the number one best young woman playing right now. Mm. And the first woman to take his challenge was not Billie Jean King. It was Margaret Court, who was the number one female tennis player, ranked number one by the Tennis Association, and had just beaten Billie Jean King to get her number one ranking. She goes, all right, Bobby, you know what? Let's dance. And they do a match on Mother's Day Mm -hmm. that Margaret Court loses. Okay. And Billie Jean King goes to this game and is like, fuck, and gives her flowers. And and it's at that point that she goes, you know what? I'll take your bet, Bobby. Mm -hmm. You know, you beat Margaret. Margaret beat me, so kind of makes sense. You could beat me too. Let's do this. Mm. This is the event that draws all of the media attention. Jack Kramer, Bobby Riggs, Billie Jean King, they they know that this is going to get a ton of eyes and it does. So it takes place at the Houston Astrodome on September 20th, 1973. It is called Battle of the Sexes. It is billed as the Battle of the Sexes. Mm -hmm. The winner takes all $100,000. And just to give you context of what else is going on in America in 1973. In January of 1973, Roe v. Wade was passed. R.I.P. Roe v. Wade. Um... 
there was that same month they suspended fighting in North Vietnam. Nixon was starting to withdraw from Vietnam. And Watergate and the scandal begins in July of that year. Yeah. So this is all kind of in the stew. And there wow. is, so I told you I watched the live television broadcast. Mm-hmm. Um, many, many people will probably also remember the movie that came out in 2017 starring Emma Stone and Steve Carell. I'm waiting to watch that movie until after because I'm sure it's great, but I didn't want to confuse the history with the movie because as wonderful as they all are, they yeah. take beautiful, creative yeah. liberties. And I always want to yeah. know which one I've got first, but it looks great. And I can't wait to see it. So this event is star-studded. George Foreman sitting in the front row. Barry Manilow is there. And uh, uh, Howard Cosell is announcing for ABC Sports. That's the way it is for the battle of the sexes. Billie Jean King against Bobby Riggs. Billie Jean King comes in first. She's carried on a Cleopatra-looking couch with, like, huge peacock feathers in front. And she by, she's carried in by, like, six gorgeous, oily, shirtless dudes. Yeah. And she's waving to the crowd. And Howard Cosell is talking about it, you know, and he goes, you know, if she let her hair grow long and took off those glasses, you could really have a Hollywood screen test. I mean, it's, and you're like, grown, yeah. Howard Cosell. Then, That's so funny. Then he goes, by the way, television audience, Jack Kramer is not with us tonight. And I know that everyone was very excited. We love Jack Kramer. He's a great announcer. He's a wonderful promoter. But Billie Jean King said he couldn't be here. She doesn't like him because of the objectionable things he said about women and women's tennis. And she said she wouldn't play if he wasn't here. We're very sad. We wish he was here, but he's not. And I'm like, I mean, he really said to like this bitch, this stupid bitch wouldn't let my best friend sit up here (laughs) with me. Then they cut to her husband. Yeah. Who she divorced later because she's totally gay. Surprise. Yeah, yeah. Her husband <laughs> that is, is like that is funny when that when she's walking out like the 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 what's his name the the guy the announcer guy Howard Cosell uh, Howard Cosell is like what a lesbo <laughs> like you know what I mean <laughs> totally like, totally like and then he's like he's totally like a little longer and then he's like let's go talk to her husband they cut to his husband and he's like we're not gonna have Jack Kramer talk because he doesn't understand how women's tennis and the sports and so far as a family we decided it wouldn't be nice then yeah. they cut to Jack Kramer. In his little desk remotely. And he's yeah. like, yeah, that bitch. He's like, yeah, she didn't want me to announce, but he's like, but I'll say it again. Bobby's going to win because women suck and they can't play tennis as well as men. And God, he really doubles man. down. It was a wonder. And then the music that they play in between commercial breaks is anything you can do, I can do better. Wow. I can do anything yeah. better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can't. They play the whole thing. Wow. So after Billie Jean King gets in, Bobby Riggs is pulled in on a wagon with all these like 20 something hot twats in middle you know mini skirts and their nice. hair is huge he's yeah. he's wearing a shiny red jacket that says sugar daddy on the back <laughs> dude and this this girls, rules and all of the girls that are carrying him are wearing little silver little red jackets that say sugar babies on them yeah because he's being sponsored by the Sugar Daddy <laughs> Popsicle Company, whatever. What so Bobby and Billie Jean meet in the middle court with 30,000 people watching mm-hmm. live in the Houston Astrodome. Wow. He gives her, Jeff, a giant Sugar Daddy lollipop mm-hmm. with the generally, I like to give my girls something to suck. Like, I mean, it's ridiculous. Wow. This is amazing. She gives him a, an adorable little pig mm-hmm. in a in a bow tie because you yeah. you're a chauvinist He's pig. A Here's pig. some good yeah, company. Yeah. Ah, ha, ha. Isn't everything yeah. great? Okay. Then they go to their seven and they start warming up. Uh-huh. Fifty million people are watching on the wow. US television. Ninety million people are watching worldwide. And uh-huh. I told you thirty plus thousand people are watching live in the stands, including the who's who of 1973. Mm-hmm. We've had all this silly, huge displays of sexism and competitiveness, whatever. Yeah. And now the match starts, right? And mm-hmm. Bobby leaves his warm-up jacket, says Sugar Daddy on it for a while, and they play back and forth. And there's just a hot second there where Billy Jean is not doing great and like, and I'm talking early on because this slut comes back, beats Bobby Riggs in two straight sets. Bam. Boom. Mm-hmm. He starts getting sweaty and less funny real early on. Yeah. And she wins the match. What? what Crazy. Was the, what was the final score of this match? Um, I know that she won the two. It was she won two, three straight sets to win the match. So they did three out of five and she won the first three. Six. I think it was six, three, six, three, six, four. Four. Okay. He didn't, one, yeah. So, one break a serve each set. So you probably. know more than I do. 
Yeah, but there, be. but she, he never, he had a, he barely had a lead, I think, in one yeah. set for, for a second she came back. And it was yeah. amazing, right? Yeah. There were arguments immediately, all of the guys who were saying men are, are we're, oh, he's 55, yeah. she's 29, all these things that they were not taking into account or saying, yeah, we're saying even an old man can beat a young woman. That's part of what we've been saying the whole yeah. time. They were very quick to put away. Then they said Bobby threw the game because he, of his gambling debts. Anything to avoid the possibility that a uh-huh. woman could beat a man with yeah. the same rules on the same court in the same game. Yeah. The other reason that a lot of people don't think that Bobby intended to lose and really didn't want to lose is that $100,000 prize was no small amount. Yeah. And he had a million dollars possibly uh-huh. coming his way if he won to have another match with another female tennis star named Chrissy Everett. That was okay. like in the works. If he beat Billie Jean, he would be playing her next. And now we've seen how many people will watch and like how much money we could mm-hmm. possibly make. I think he had a lot of reasons to win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think yeah, that yeah. Bobby Riggs probably really would have preferred to have won that match. Yeah. Billie Jean King goes on to work closely with the Philip Morris cigarette company because Virginia Slims sponsored a ton of like female tennis tournaments yeah. and amazing. That's so funny too. Like yeah. just cigarettes sponsoring a health tennis event. You know what I mean? Right. Like, We've come a long way, baby. Yeah. <laughs> but how much yeah. do you want one of those sugar daddies like yeah. jackets? Like I'm That's gonna find. I'm gonna cool, find yeah. you for, for Christmas yeah. this year, Jeff. I'm gonna get my ass on gear. I'm Hell gonna get yeah. you a Bobby Riggs sugar daddy. I love it. Shiny red. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The next story is another um, rivalry story. Okay. Um, it takes place exactly 10 years later in what I think is arguably tennis's heyday, which is the 1980s. Yeah. Um, this was like the peak of tennis for totally. sure. Totally. And the peak of sexy tennis, yeah. right? You had John McEnroe, Eli Nastasi. That's, but that's like, that was like the peak of like rock star tennis. Rock because star tennis. When Agassi came out, he had like the long hair. They started naming the the rackets like they had a racket that they still use that's still in production today after Agassi came out. Mm-hmm. They call it the radical. Oh my god. Like radical, radical bro. bro. Like, yeah, so, and you're like, mm, stuck in nineteen eighty eight, are yeah, we? Yeah. But that but like they started naming tennis rackets that. You know, like to be cool, sure. before it's like the yeah, prestige the gentleman, or the, the gentleman, yeah, yeah, lawn tennis. That same company, their flagship player racket is called the prestige. Ah. So, yeah. Pure sex, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Most of the sources that I read tend to agree. And it sounds like you kind of knew this going in. Yeah. That the individual who's really responsible set the tone was the first rock star of tennis to be a heartthrob to teenagers, an icon of fashion, yeah. somebody that you wanted to read about in magazines. It was Bjorn Borg. He came out in 1983. This guy is, I like to think about like the Harry Styles of tennis. It was like, it doesn't matter if you're into tennis. It yeah. doesn't even matter if you're into dudes. You just kind of. He was like a whimsical sweet that was like real like long hair like cool guy totally dimples here i got a picture ice in the veins Look yeah at this guy. he was a hot dude totally um, he wore that 80s the, um sweat the band. shortest shorts dude so short oh yeah um so like with him too like he was very like quiet and reserved on the court uh-huh. so he was very like regimented and like very like still like nothing gets to this guy this totally. guy's so smooth and quiet like which was such a cool like mm -hmm. juxtaposition because he was one of the youngest guys playing Mm -hmm. he started playing as a teenager and he does have this long hair and he's so cute so you almost expect him to be kind of a live wire and he was known for never losing his temper Mm -hmm. never even seeing to display like fuck i fucked that up as opposed to someone like john McEnroe who's having outbursts who's spazzing and like losing his mind all the time and this is the rivalry they're both young with long hair and totally cool. And mm. so in some ways, John McEnroe was like the American reflection of yeah. this calm he's from, Swede. Yeah, he's from New York. He's loud. He's a totally. fucking jerk. He'd get in know? trouble all the time. He said the big one. His big <laughs> <laughs> I love McEnroe, I, I do love McEnroe, he McEnroe too. Rules. He was, and he was good. And, he, and you had to be good because Bjorn Borg was crazy good. He went pro when he was 16. Uh-huh. He wins and he just... Keeps winning by his 18th birthday. They say that the confetti was still in his hair from Mm. his 18th birthday. He wins the Australian Open 
once. He won, wins the French Open six times. He wins Wimbledon five times. And he wins the U.S. Open four times. Also, him winning <clears throat> the French Open six times is like fucking bonkers, bonkers at the time. Like, no one had done that. Completely. And, also, and Wimbledon either. He had won Wimbledon at this point where he gets head-to-head with John McEnroe. Mm-hmm. He had won Wimbledon four times and was going to, like, okay, am I going to win it five times? Mm-hmm. This could be my fifth win. And here's this tough ass New York loud mm. long haired guy John yeah. McEnroe and they meet as soon as McEnroe gets on the court he's booed which yeah. you pointed out you don't fucking do he's that like, shit during tennis he's very like like McEnroe kind of like was early like heel like I don't know if you're familiar with like WWE kind of oh sure heel yeah. kind of yeah. stuff yeah. where it's like we're supposed to not like this guy yeah it's but it's like, like it's fun guy. yeah it's like you like the rock was like that in wrestling like he comes out and was like fuck Boogie. this guy yeah. this guy Boogie. sucks and then but like, I love he does this guy. rule yeah you know, I, know like, I love hating him he's like Boogie a dickhead but he's like a lovable dickhead because he's so good mm-hmm. and John McEnroe is at Wimbledon like he's he's going head to head for this number mm-hmm. one spot for a reason and part of the reason why they booed him too wasn't because of like a general dislike it was kind of specifically because he had just like shouted out and cursed out a bunch of uh, yeah. referees in the previous <laughs> yeah, game and he'd tell the press to go fuck themselves and he'd guy. throw he's just he's, he's kind of a, a dick such a dick it's such a dick and you have to compare that to the nicest sweetest Swede you've ever met so the, yeah. he couldn't be more di- different however by everyone's account, when oh. McEnroe played Borg, he was calm and had no outbursts. Yeah. And there was even a moment during this early game in Wimbledon where McEnroe started to kind of get like worked up. Uh-huh. And Borg said, it's okay, man. Like at the net, there was like an it's okay, man kind of deal. And people were like, oh, is he trying to get into his head? Is he trying to like come? Yeah. And they were like, no, Borg's actually just like a super cool, chill guy. Uh-huh. Saw his opponent getting rifled up and was like, take it. Yeah, no, no big deal, guy. Take it. And McEnroe, like, calmed down and played really well. And they're playing, bah. And it's everything is, you know, go back and forth so long that they have a fourth set tiebreaker that lasts 20 minutes. And McEnroe's amazing. And he's doing really well and he even gets ahead, but ultimately he couldn't break the serve. And Bjorn pulls it out in a wild fifth set mm-hmm. that many people still say was the single greatest match of all time. Mm -hmm. If you were there at Wimbledon and you saw it, it was crazy. Yeah. But Borg wins. It's his fifth Wimbledon. He's still quote the best, right? Yeah. Two months later, they meet again for a a fifth set final in the 1980 U S open, which you'll remember is the last of the majors in the calendar year. Um, and this one McEnroe beats Borg, Mm -hmm. but at the end of the year, when they do the tally on who's the best tennis player, the math yeah. <laughs> still favors Borg, and Borg is listed number one in the world. Okay, so now the next calendar year starts uh-huh. with our whole new batch of opens. And at the 1981 Wimbledon, McEnroe is fined mm-hmm. because he said, and you're going to have to hold your pearls. You're going to grasp your pearls because I can't believe he said this on the tennis yeah. court. He shouted serious, to the man. ref. You cannot be serious. <gasps> I mean, it was horrible. He got fined. Yeah. He was almost ejected from the game. Yeah. It was such a crazy catchphrase that he titled his autobiography, yeah. You Cannot Be Serious. And he is screaming this. He is screaming like, it, though. It is his eyes like, are bulging. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. He's a little spooky. Yeah, yeah for sure. When he spazzes, it's so funny. Because it's like so much passion. He really gives a shit. It's 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 kind of awesome to see. It is really fun to see. It yeah. is a lot like watching your child, though. Because yeah. I do see sometimes my kid throws yeah. a fit, and I do have to step back and be it's like, t- that's really beautiful. A tennis kid having a tantrum. Yeah. It's like all, all your veins are out. That's mm-hmm. really hard to do. Yeah. Um, well, this one is it coined again. They meet head to head, and it's Iceman versus the Super Brat. Yeah. And that's how I'm with the yeah. thing. And again, they're, they're, McEnroe is remarkably comparatively calm when mm-hmm. he's playing, and he wins. Mm-hmm. McEnroe wins that one. And Wimbledon, though, the cunts, they're kind of cunts to him. They don't they don't give him his honorary membership, and he doesn't go to some fucking dinner. You know, wow. there's drama within the tennis club. So then they meet a few months later, one more time, head to head. And this rivalry now, people are like, oh my God, you know? Uh-huh. Our Borg is the definitive best, has been the best, is so young, is so calm, but now he's lost twice to McEnroe, and it's like, how is he gonna go? So they meet again, head to head, US Open, last one of the year. Uh, McEnroe wins in four sets. He becomes the first guy since the 20s 
to win three consecutive U.S. Open singles titles. So wow. he his star is rising. And now we know what happens next. These two fucking guys have been playing these. And I told you how many matches and games and sets you're playing this all the time. Here's what happens next. Loser comes out and goes, oh, yeah. Next time I'm going to try in the court, maybe in the hard court. And then I, they do a good game. And then the winner says, yeah, I fucking did it. And then everyone goes home. Mm-hmm. And they're out there and there's no Borg. Where'd he go? Mm-hmm. And everyone's kind of like, where is he? This is, and they're to the point where they're like, no, really, where is he? And they're like, he left. He's gone. Wow. Like he left the, like he went to Nepal, girl. Wow. Yeah. He calls a press conference from Kathmandu. Wow. And says I'm out. I quit. I retire forever. Yeah. He was like 25 he too. He was 26. He had 26. just turned 20. Wow. Six. Now he does some exhibition games and he says, I'll do exhibition games. If you want to pay me a couple hundred thousand dollars, go play tennis with your uncle or whatever. Like That's I'll do that. So crazy. He does try one comeback. Oh dude. I, I watched a YouTube video about this comeback. Yes. It is bonkers. It's dude. sad. It's so sad. It's yeah. really sad. He comes back in the nineties. Who doesn't want, who doesn't try to come back in the nineties girl? He grows his hair yeah. long again. He wears his old, like he tries to kind he, of capture he, the old cool 20 yeah. something guy. He's doing the old shit. Like he played in an era where wooden rackets were being used. And now he's like using a, like you, everyone is using metal rackets. You should yeah. 100% use a metal racket. It's like stupid to not. Yeah. And he's like, well, this is the racket this I This is used. the racket I use. And it's, it's stupid as shit. He loses every set. He mm-hmm. doesn't win a single set. He gets, annihilated. Set. He gets yeah. annihilated. By like nobodies too. Horrible, right? And yeah. it's to the point where people are like, I don't even want to see this. He looks like shit on the court. He's like yeah. missing all the time. Just getting crushed. Crushed. Before though, you shed too many tears mm-hmm. for Borg. He does. He gets out. He's like, all right, never mind. Yeah. Uh, never mind. He does have a really successful fashion label uh-huh. that is second only to Calvin Klein. Wow. Apparently in Sweden, and he has a he lives in an island off the Swedish coast. That's, he's, that's good. He's comfortably upset. Yeah. You know what's great? There's a movie. Apparently, 2017 is the year everyone made tennis movies. This is when mm. the Battle of the Sexes movie came out. There was another independent film I found called McEnroe mm. versus Borg. Yeah. And it stars Shia LaBeouf. Okay. As McEnroe <laughs> and this Swedish guy named Sphere Gudnanson as Borg, who looks fucking perfect, looks exactly like yeah. you. And I, I went to watch the trailer for this movie like, ooh, boy, is this going to be terrible. Mm-hmm. Looks amazing, actually. Really? I'll send you the link. Right. It actually yeah, looks pretty dope. Um, and McEnroe, in 2015, this kind of ties our first two stories all back together. At 56, John McEnroe on Jimmy Kimmel Live said he would play Serena Williams in a mm-hmm. battle of the second, which you're like, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Um, he said he would he would play, and this was in 2015. Trump apparently said he would sponsor the match. This is before he was president. And this was oh wait. So when 20 was so in 2015, Donald Trump told John McEnroe that he would help sponsor an exhibition match between him and Serena Williams. And but that he said no because apparently Trump wasn't offering enough money. Like oh my goodness. I love that. On our way out, I have a game. I have four questions for you, tennis related. Okay. They are about balls, strokes, slams, and grunting. Okay. Bring it all back to fucking. Sure. At the end of the day. Hell yeah. Question. How often do you have to swap out the ball? Uh, I believe they switch the balls every four games, I think. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. According to the internet, <laughs> they do swap the ball out every nine games. Nine but the games. first one oh. is changed out after only seven games because they use that ball during the pre-match the warm-up. warm-up. Yeah, okay. All right, one, All right. You can lose one. 15, 14. There are considered eight basic kinds of strokes in tennis. You know, the serve, forehand, backhand, volley. Please describe or demonstrate... The stroke known as the overhead smash. Okay, the overhead smash is um, if someone, if you are at the net and somebody lobs you the ball, it's basically a serve motion, like a throw, like you know you're hitting it from over your head and you are smashing it down into the into the court. It's kind of a volleyball spike. Yeah. It's like the slam dunk of tennis, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And it looks really cool when you do yeah. it. And as long and there's and as long as your opponent 
is not yeah. directly under it and pops it back in your face, then it tends well, to Well, if they're directly well. under it, they're probably going to die because people <laughs> hit it like 140 miles an hour. I believe that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, all right. That's, that's, uh, that's one. Bing. Okay. All right. all right. We discussed the various slams and what they mean. The mm. one I omitted is a surface slam. What mm. is a surface slam? Uh, when you win a title on all of the different surfaces. Yeah, of course. Perfect. Yeah. The, the clay or the grass, clay, hard court. Those mm -hmm. are the three. Yes. Yeah. That's two. This is the third one. Okay. This is, it could be it. Okay. True or false, the sexual and awkward reality of listening to tennis players grunt and heave with every stroke has initiated an active movement to stop it. Coaches, breathing experts, and others are working with several professional tennis players to try to get them to curb the grunting in favor of other expressions of force. Okay. True or false? Uh, I believe there is a little bit of a movement about that, but I would say no. Like, it's, you know, people are going to grunt, you know? I, I do think that they've wanted to, like, chill it especially on the women's side because there's been some uh ah! some super loud ah! crazy goes, ones oh my yeah. god yeah victoria azarenka mm -hmm. um and like some of these grunts are carrying over to the other players hit which is a hindrance you're not allowed to speak while the other person is right hitting but if it's part of your stroke then i guess everyone that's like Putting their entire body into their stroke is probably And doing. you hear in like karate and in all martial arts, they talk about keying up like that. It actually gives you more force. It they does. did a study mm. and they found that the people who grunted yeah. hit harder and you're, hit better and won more often. But it, it is, but you're but unfortunately there is an active movement to stop it wow. to the point where there are a lot of organized tennis groups that are calling for bans. And they're saying you can't ban it man you can't tell people that yeah. they can't and they're saying we already have bans against when yeah. you can speak and when you can make noise yeah this is just an obvious extension of that but then they're saying but you can see we've proven yeah. already that the players who grunt and heave are doing it as part of their game and it yeah. and it gives them an edge and then the other people like exactly gives them an edge and also it is so loud in particular maria mm -hmm. sharapa say her name maria sharapova maria sharapova mm -hmm. They registered one of her grunts at a hundred decimals with yeah. every shot, which is apparently the equivalent of an airplane taking off. Yeah. yeah. And it's exhilarating. Yeah. It's <laughs> awesome. Dude. Titillating. Yeah. Um, you got to, you, you know what? I, I blew Deuce. it. Yeah. yeah Deuce. Like deuced. That's yeah. right. <laughs> well, listen, I uh, want to say thank you again. Because mm -hmm. you have assigned me a subject that I didn't know I was going to love and I loved a lot. Well, and I'm glad I you did. I had a blast. And, I've, and also I'll be able to watch tennis now and say things like, oh, I don't know if he'll get the next set. Or, oop, that's a overhead <laughs> smash. And, oh, yeah. and you there know, you really all I do this for is the potential clout in a bar, in a sports bar. <laughs> Hell yeah. Thank Which you also, if you go to a sports bar, guaranteed whatever tennis event is going on is not playing on the TVs. You will have to be like, can you turn on tennis? Yeah. And then they will look at you like, what is that? They're like, I don't know. There's a few guys in here watching the badminton yeah. what, tournament. Yeah, they, yeah, they what they channel pretty, is that on? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Be like, I don't know. We got some pickleball coming up in a minute. Some yeah. people are pretty stoked about. Well, not on my watch, man. I'm, I'm going to single-handedly, mm -hmm. without playing or being good at it myself, mm -hmm. um, try to encourage people to... Um, handle their balls. Hell yeah. I love it. <laughs> Thanks again, Joe. Thank you. Oh, my guest, Jeff Zenisek. Please go follow him. Subscribe to his podcast, Two Woke Boys. Watch his videos, all the things. But don't be a dick, okay? He's too nice a guy to get banned again. <laughs> As for us, new episodes every other Wednesday. And next, my guest is a best friend. She was my maid of honor. I was her maid of honor. We have honorary tattoos to each other. Man, we knew each other when we both used fake IDs to drink in college. All right, you get it. <laughs> she is singer-songwriter Rhiannon Fiskraditz. Mm. And the subject she assigned me? Fairies. Yeah, it's amazing. We sip mimosas and go hard on these translucent little fuckers. <laughs> Don't miss it.
In the meantime, our theme song was composed and performed by Kat Perkins. A reminder that you can find my sources, links to the books, documentaries, and articles I reference in the summary of this episode or by emailing us hilfpodcast at gmail.com or messaging us on social media at hilfpodcast. This has been Hilf, History I'd Like to Fuck with Don Brody. I'm Don Brody reminding you that history is a party and everybody's coming. (laughs) <laughs> Join host Dave Houghton and Sarah Ray Pallet as they examine the less glamorous side of sports with their podcast, In a Pickle. Follow IAP Radio on social media by going to iapradio.com. In a Pickle is now part of the Den Network. For more information, go to iapradio.com.